Well, I'm looking at this banana plant here, which is fairly common in the landscape in South Florida. Uh, there's a whole row of different varieties here. I think we have like 64 that are grown. Uh, this one's actually putting on fruit. It's almost ready to pick. Yes, yeah. and you can see that there's some black growth here. What really brought my attention to this plant is that there's some black sooty mold growing all along this leaf, and up here you see it's very Ooh. sticky. Now this is an indication that we do have a problem. Oh, no. Now you can find this black sooty mold. Uh, it'll, it'll be on the plants, it'll be on the landscape, you'll find it on the stucco of your house, and it is uh, causing a lot of problems here in South Florida. Now will it kill or damage the plant? It's not going to kill the plant in and of itself. The sooty mold will actually impact photosynthesis because it gets so dense that it turns the whole top of the leaf black. It's keeping the sunlight from hitting that leaf surface. So what is the cause of the sooty mold? This is a fungus and it's growing on honeydew. Oh. It's this very sticky sugary material that was on the leaf and the fungus is growing on it. Okay. The honeydew is produced by an insect. In this case, it's a white fly. Now this white fly is extremely important. It's causing a huge problem here in Florida. It's called the rugose spiraling white fly. It's an invasive species and it's found from here to up to Palm Beach County and it's destroying plants. It doesn't look too bad on this banana plant. We're lucky. We caught this population very early. So we detected it by the honeydew but this is what it can be. Ooh. As you can see on this sample, the bottom of the leaf is white as a result of the white fly, and there's large population here, and on the top it's black from the sooty mold. It won't kill the plant in the short term, okay? But if they don't deal with it and don't take proper cultural practices to get rid of the honeydew and get rid of the bugs, over and over again it'll, it'll cause damage, okay? There are a number of tactics that we can use to manage this white fly. In this case, we have a systemic insecticide. Now, a systemic insecticide means it's absorbed by the plant, goes throughout the whole plant. So any part of the plant the insect eats will kill the insect. Oh. There are a number of issues with using this particular product. One, the banana is not listed on it, so it's illegal to use on bananas. Oh. Secondly, it's an indiscriminate killer. It's going to kill anything that's on the plant, which yeah. we don't need at this point. Yeah, and usually once you start spraying, you have to continue over and over. Oh, I see. I consider a much better approach is using biological control and controlling these insects biologically. We have a lot of different natural enemies that feed on white flies. This particular one is called a green lacewing. It's already found here in Florida. It's indigenous. We're not introducing something weird or unique. And this thing will feed on white flies. And you can actually buy them commercially. And this is the only insect that I would recommend to buy commercially for this particular pest. And once the population of these green lacewings builds up, it'll control the white fly by eating them. Oh, wow. And this is how they come in from a commercial insectary. They mass rear them, they put them in this little container, and ship them to us overnight. Okay. This is pretty straightforward. All we do is open the lid to this, try to let the adults escape a few at a time, try to get them to go on the underside of the leaf here, and you can see that they're flying around, they're agitated, they want to find some place to go. And you can actually get them by the wings. And they just don't them. bite? No, they don't bite. They oh. only eat. They don't. They don't actually feed on the insects themselves. It's the immature stages that do all the work. Whoops. And there we go. Same color as the plant. They're going to go where they want to go. Okay. But some of them are going to stay pretty close to where where I release them. Now I want to put some up here where we have honeydew because they like to feed on honeydew. So what I'll do is I'll carry this up here, and just kind of let them get out, and hopefully they will. There one went. There's hundreds in here, so it's a matter of just, uh, there we go. You can see there's one on the leaf, and it's already reacting to the honeydew. Basically, that's all there is to it. You just release them. There's enough here. You hope that they find a place that's going to be uh, acceptable for them to lay eggs, and they'll become established and start managing your whitefly population. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. 
On the other side of the yard, I noticed that this hibiscus has a major issue as well. Oh, well, no wonder. It does look sick to me, and it used to be beautiful with many, many profuse red, double-bloomed hibiscus flowers. Um, now, when it does bloom, they just drop. I don't know what's going on with my tree. Well, one of the first indications is that you see this, these leaves, they're all curled up, they're distorted, and it's just not growing correctly. This is called bunchy top, and it's caused by another invasive species called the pink hibiscus mealybug. Okay. Okay? And basically, in these little tight knots are mealybugs. And you can see in this portion that I've removed, this is a Ooh. blossom, and you can see the white fluffy mass that's there, that contains eggs, it contains adult mealybugs, immature mealybugs. And by feeding on the plant and putting saliva into the plant, it protects itself by having the plant grow around it. Oh. Okay, so that is the, the, the cause of all of the damage that you see on here. I see. Now, chemical control, you know, we could treat this plant. But the problem is, is that you have neighbors that yeah. also have the mealybug, and if they don't treat, this plant will be continually infested with this mealybug. So the idea would be to use biological control, and they don't res respect the boundary. They'll go over there and feed on the mealybug, so we have a better chance of managing the mealybug in this whole area by using biological controls. So it's gonna be the same principle as on the banana plant. We're gonna build up a population of good insects. They're gonna spread out through the neighborhood eating mealybugs, and we're gonna end up with clean plants both for us and the neighbors. Oh, I like that. That's the idea. And what we're gonna do this time is use a different insect. In this case, it's called Cryptolamus montrozeri. Okay. Oh. But we also call it the mealybug destroyer. Oh, I like that oh. one. Are we just gonna sprinkle them on? No, we actually have a different technique. In this case, we use a bag that we put around the branch and we put the beetles in it. Now, the cage we're using is a simple paint strainer that you can get at any home uh, goods store that strains paint. In oh. this case, it's a one gallon. It has uh, a nylon and a, an elastic band around it. We put the beetles inside the cage and then we just drape it over the leaf like this. Okay. And that's all you do. And what I want you to do in about a week, just come out and remove the bag. And it's okay if the beetles fly away at that point? Yeah, because within a week they'll have mated and laid eggs in here, and that's what we want to do to start a whole new population. I love it. We're changing bad bugs for good bugs and controlling our pest situation in the yard. Much more sustainable than just spraying pesticides. I love it. Thank you both very, very much for your help. You're welcome. My pleasure. Roger, it seems like more and more people are trying to get away from these chemicals. Once this gets up into a plant, it kills the bad bugs, but it also kills the good bugs. It doesn't know the difference, and we want to save the good bugs. Yeah. Well, you said the bad bugs aren't from this area. How do they get here? They can come from a country, another country, on a pallet, a flower, or even a piece of fruit. And mm. once they get there, they have no predators, so they just grow and spread yeah. like crazy, yeah. and they cause a problem. So the key is finding the right predator, but how do you go about finding that predator? Well, fortunately, we don't have to do it. Most state universities have an extension service that majors in agricultural problems. They go out and they find the good bugs that'll eat these and introduce them to us. Now, most people aren't gonna get a visit from a local professional <laughs> like that, like we did. But you can get all the information you need from the extension service. And is it safe to assume that for every bad bug, there's another good bug out there that will eat it? We hope so, but you gotta go back to the original home of the bad bug to find the predator, then you gotta collect it bring it back here and establish it in I'll, order for it to I'll have go. control. Yeah. You'd be a good yeah, bad bug guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Roger, good information. Thank you. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thewey. I'm Tom Silva. And I'm Roger Cook. For Ask This Old House. Guys, you guys are starting to bug me. <laughs> <laughs>